Alright, well, another cold night for it. Um, I can really see that the carcass has just relaxed a little bit more now, which is really good. And I feel like there's just a little bit of softness back in the skin, so that hanging's really had a lovely effect on it. I'm just going to um, knock these hocks off first, and then I'll probably just take the head out of the equation too, just um, to start making this a little bit more workable. And look, I'm in the fortunate position that being on a you know, piece of rural land, you can very easily bury um, animal remains and things like that. In the city, you probably wouldn't be able to. If you had a little um, bin set up where you're going to put some of these disposables, um, you probably want to line it with a plastic bag so you can just whack it in the bin just before pickup day or something like that. But here I am on the knuckle. Oh, careful with that knife. And you know, just find the pivot points. And you'll be able to feel around the joint that there's just a number of tendons coming down which are connecting all of this. And for this I'm using the real base end of my knife there. There, see that with one tendon off, nice and loose. Another little tendon on the side there. Bend of my knife here. Um, because it's the part of the knife that I use the least. I don't really mind if it hits a little bit of bone by accident. And now that I've taken out a few of them, just... There we are. That just breaks. And then we just see whatever's left over. Ah, oh, it's just the middle tendon in the middle. Boom. So you get a hock off. Alrighty, now I'm not here to be stating the obvious or anything, but here we are looking at a front shoulder. This is the front leg, this is the neck, this is the rib cage here, this is where the back straps are. Of course, you've got the top legs at the top there. The way I'm going to approach this is going to be starting from basically the bottom up. And it's funny, there's, there's often an instinct to go straight for the back straps, which are, for those who don't understand, they're along the spine, probably one of the most prized cuts in the deer. Um, but by going straight for certain key parts, you can actually miss out on a lot. And I'm going to take these shoulders off first, and I'm going to show you why in a second. By taking the shoulder off, it's going to actually expose more of that beautiful backstrap fillet that actually tucks itself just underneath the shoulder blade as well. So if you're going to take that, if you're going to take a backstrap straight away from the top, um, you'd be missing out on a little bit extra. So yeah, we're going to start on the shoulders. Then I'm going to do the neck, and then we're going to start working on the rib cage section here. But I'll just keep it structured shoulders and this is one of the easiest sections of the deer break off I'm gonna rearrange the camera so you can get a better view so definitely one of the simplest cuts to take off um, obviously we have the rib cage here and we've got this line between the ribs and the shoulder blade there Let's pass the knife through that and it's worthwhile remembering that it goes a lot further up than people realize so it's good to follow it all the way to the top of the actual shoulder blade itself. Tell you what, heavier than a fallow shoulder, that's for sure. So I'm going to take a good grip of that. And down it comes. Oh. Solid. Awesome. So rather than putting all this effort into knocking the red's head off, I'm going to actually just flay all the meat off the side. So it's good at this stage in the process just to have some containers. Normally I have stainless steel trays, they're all in use, so I'm, I don't usually use a disposal. Just good to have all your different cuts and stuff organised. I know a lot of people that if they have two people working on this, as soon as a piece comes off, they might be dicing it up already into um, strips for stir fries, um, diced it up for casseroles and things like that. Um, so get a bit of a assembly line kind of situation happening. You can see from right at the top here, and I can feel it right now, it's a line of sinew, it's the the top of the neck there. Big heavy tendon strip down the middle. I'm just using that as my center line. And look, there's quite a few different muscles here, but as you can see, I'm just following the guide. And then it gets to a point when it goes around the vertebrate. So you've got to just be careful just to follow, follow the bones. Just trying to keep it all off as one piece so they'll have a neck roast and look there's a few little bits and pieces that i could also get but just in the interest of keeping one solid strip 
Let me just cut it off short. Anyway. Following the bones around. Another one. There's two lovely neck roasts. And um, to be perfectly honest, I haven't actually ever done a neck roast before. Um, I don't have an oven, so I don't roast much. Um, but yeah, if anyone has, and has some good ideas on how they do that, um, please put it in the comments below. It'll benefit, thank you very much. Now, here's our ribs. And the rib cage comes up and around. It finishes just about here. And then we have the leg here. So we've got this huge little um, flap of skin here and also a flap that comes around the outside of the ribs just here. Um, that's one really good handy piece to use because um, we'll just you can see which way the grain's going. That's just automatic strips of jerky. That's um, really easy pieces to put together for, um, for stir fry and stuff like that. I'm gonna actually just take this outside block off right now. Um, I think it's a lesser used piece of meat and for years actually, to be honest, um, they were probably wasted on a lot of my animals. And then I tried it and it's, there's nothing lacking in tenderness about it. It's just as good as any other bits. It's just, and it's not an awkward cut, as some would say, because there's just so many practical uses for it. Beautiful, really easy. I'm gonna actually dice that up straight away. Edge of the ribs there. Again, this is not the prime cuts, but it's all good and usable. All right, back strap. If, you watched, if you've watched any hunting media ever in your life, you've probably seen this done, but may as well show everyone anyway. And again, you can just see here, that line just there. That is why I made a point of taking the front shoulder off first, is because that back strap, even though it gets thinner, continues all the way up here underneath that shoulder. There's still also a bit of a sinew covering at the top here, and actually a lot of that's, um, that's fat, um, which will get taken off the main cut. But I might actually get rid of that now. Now, to be honest though, if I was in the bush, I wouldn't be worrying about taking this off at all. It would just be knife straight in directly with the cut and I could get this off later. Such is the beauty of having it all hung up that I can do it once properly. All right, you can see the top crest here and I'm following right up close to the, to the vertebrae. And all the way down, just starting off there and getting as close to the bones as possible and once you meet the cut that comes from this side and you can pull it out a little bit all of it becomes a lot easier just if you get it right now there's just next to zero wastage I'm getting right up into the rump section here so I'm gonna call it across there beautiful so as it comes down you're just making sure you're working both squares worth doing it carefully so that a whole bunch of good stuff doesn't just get ripped off like that <sighs> jinxed it <sighs> so much there So that's good. And yeah, towards the neck there, yeah, it narrows that a bit, but that doesn't mean that it's any less good. And to be honest, like, just that side there, that's probably the size of what you get out of a, a good fallow deer anyway. And all you have to do is um, trim off that silver skin before you present it. We'll do that later anyway. That's nice. Alrighty, I've got a slightly different plan for how I'm gonna do the other side. Um, so before I get stuck into that other back strap, I just want to show you this is the tenderloins, often touted as being the most high quality and tender section of meat on an animal. And you can just see there's a little bit of these um, bit of fat around that. That's not a problem at all. Just break that off. 
but you've got your spine coming up the middle here and then one or two of them either side like that and obviously on an animal this big they're a reasonable size that you can actually make a whole meal out of them find my side point and you're cutting them out much the same way as you would the back strap beautiful I can actually just feel like that flakes so easily that's tenderloin and um, a little bit to clean up on that side but I'll be very cautious as I clean it up because uh, that's worth wasting you can see I've taken out this back strap down to this point here and that's where the rib cage starts um, with the help of this Cipro um, I'm gonna carve off the ribs in strips down here but then I'm gonna take this as like a rack of ribs just from here and then along the cent center of the spine and then that way people can also just cut cutlets off each portion of that I think that's a really nice way for people to be able to serve it, it makes the best out of a backstrap serving too um, yeah another thing you could do um, if you didn't have a recipro of course is just um, an axe even or a, a good strong cleaver um, break down the center of the brisket here a few good heavy chops would be more than enough you need to do to manage that um, and if you if it's a good quality enough tool uh, you should be able to cut down the line of ribs that way too I think it's the one thing that we're mindful of here is blunt force can um, create shards of bone and you want to just be very careful of that sometimes it's inevitable I and mean, when I put this recipro through there's going to be a little bit of um, bone powder which I'm going to just wipe off with a cloth um, but yeah so that's just a few other tools you can do for that Anyway, I'm going to get stuck into this with a zip throat. Sorry, what I should have done as well is actually carve down a line of where I actually want the ribs cut so that we could get the sinew off either side there. And then that way, because the recipro's job is not really to cut through soft tissue, really for the bone, so I created myself a bit of a line there. I thought I was pressing record on that last bit, so that's all right because there's another rack to cut here. Again, I've cut a little strip of the sinew off, so I know where to follow. There's a lovely rack of ribs just there. And this way, again, you can just cut the portions that you wish to serve. I'd probably even roll that up and um, cook it all as one. You can see what I mean by just a little bit in the way of bone fragments, which um, it's just good to really give it a little bit of wash off and a wipe down before getting into the cooking side of things. But otherwise, lovely. Part I really don't want to stuff up. I'm um, going to just cut along the spine here, which wouldn't be too difficult. I have cut along here this back strap so that it's all separate. No, don't worry about it. Before I waste any more back strap, I'll pull it there. Oh, well, that's just off the right error, unfortunately, but not too bad. And there, folks, that is a rack of ribs with backstrap attached. So, as you go along each line, that's your cutlet. And that's kind of perfect, and that's like a really nice, valuable piece to offer to people and. You know, something you can have at a party or a bit of an event. It's really nice, you know. Finally onto the main leg. Now, the pelvis bone is in the center of this. And by starting in the middle, going each side, I'd like to be able to just trace the edges of that as carefully as possible. So again, there's no wastage and um, 
and once we've got both legs divided up well then I can demonstrate a breakdown and then I'll probably just have to get along with the rest of it myself without filming it because it's a long process but that's okay so yeah expose the ball joint and that's surrounded by a layer of cartilage which you do have to break through and that's why the blunter end of the boning knife I shouldn't say blunt the snouty end of the boning knife comes into real handy here this is one of those times where it is quite easy to scrape along bone so just taking time with it and for anyone who's wondering just that meat going a little bit dark colored there is just because it's been air dried um, it's just been a little less humid today and as soon as you take that top layer off, you're left with gorgeous meat underneath it. So that's all good. So we've released the ball joint. And again, following along the edge of this pelvis bone as much as possible. Now I'm feeling there's a little bit of the end of the pelvis bone sticking out there so it's very easy to get it wrong run along the bone so I'm just breaking it down along the edge of it and almost around it you see how I'm using that gravity on my favor a lot of weight there though cool we're around it just flipping it around to have a go from the top side same story right along that backbone there's that nice layer of cartilage and bone and this is what we call the rump the rump cut because it's on its rump so you're yeah, just carving down the edge of that I'm actually already starting to meet up with the other cuts that I did before there we are peeling it across like this so you can see what I've done. Uh, look, how's it? Oh, it's a red deer leg. We'll repeat the same step on this side, but whilst I've got the camera going, I'm going to show you how to break down a leg of deer like this. So that's the other leg that's still got the pelvis in it. I'm going to grab all these shoulders. So I'm going to show you guys how to do a front and a back leg, how to break that down into the smaller cuts. Just as a bit of a spread so far, it just kind of gives you a real picture about how much you can get out of one animal like this. And um, it's very pleasing. It's very exciting actually. Alrighty. Well, what I like to do more than anything is just to be able to butterfly the whole thing out and then it's very easy to see the different muscle groups once it's all opened up and spread. So the first thing I notice is there's the ball joint attached to the femur. Well, it actually goes down that way. Um, and the first separation here, very obvious separation of muscles. We're just looking for those points of least resistance, the connective tissue between major muscle groups. Because once you've got a, you know, a whole muscle group kind of isolated, there's just so much you can do with it. That's where you can cut your, um, your steaks from. I mean, to be perfectly honest, I'll just package most of this up just as an individual muscle group because then I can decide later what I want to actually do with it. Um, you know, on a Sunday before the start of a working week, I might take one muscle group off, cut a bunch of steaks from it, cut the rest into um, little bits and pieces for stir fries because, you know, you can't be a gourmet chef every night of the week. So you can just see the separations there. And I'm just following that connective tissue, bringing it round. Look at that. that's one now look at this one just here now if you ever uh, want to be a cheeky brick and um, pretend you've given someone a back strap you can always just get this 
side here. And then it comes off in a very similar shape. That's a very familiar shape, isn't it? And to be perfectly honest though, if you've aged it properly, there's no reason for any of these cuts of meat to be nothing but beautiful and tender. So again, we're going to use this, um, the femur here, which is heading that way, does a dog leg. I wonder why they call it that. Carefully separate this edge off. I'm actually going to keep these femurs. I've got something planned for them, which I'll share with you soon. Awesome. So the theme is free now. That's good. And there's a whole bunch of lumps that I can take off this. What I'm actually going to plan to do here is I'm going to actually just take the whole rump off the top. Yeah, so I'm taking all of that off because I know that I'm going to dice all that up and make a, a slow cook in the next couple of days with that. So that's my plan with that, that's why I took that off all as one. Getting underneath there. Separating the femur from the leg like that. We're left with all of this. And these are portions which I find very workable. See what I mean? They're just so easily separated. Nice. So I'm just going to vacuum seal it just like that. There's the steaks if you want them. There's a whole roast if you want it. There's a heap of diced up meat there if you want it. Point is, I can decide that at the start of each week. This is part of the ball roast there, and there's parts of that which I can break down further, but I'm probably going to leave that all as one, just because, again, start up another week, it's my decision what I end up doing with it. There is femur. What you have there is just the perfect size to put into a camp oven if you're heading out with a bunch of people. Um, yeah, it's lovely. Same with the other shanks and stuff like that as well, but if you just had to put one in there, that's just a beautiful one for it. Low and slow, falling apart, delicious. Well, this table's getting full. Everywhere's getting full. A long day of it, another long day of it. I just wanna show you Obviously, if this was a fallow, you might not even bother breaking this up, but on a big red like this or a samba, you might want to break it into chunks. Although a lot of this lends itself to roasts, um, a lot of the time I've always just filleted the different muscle groups off this, which don't lend themselves to steaks and stuff very well, but are extremely tender pieces of meat. I think the shoulder is an unbelievably underrated cut. First things first though, let's just get this bottom chunk off it. and. See there's like a little knuckle there. Just cut away down along there. And then find where that joint is. Same as the front legs, fantastic for the camp oven. See that top line there, that's on the back of the shoulder blade just a bone that sticks out from it. There's this bone here, and then right between that, there's a gap. So, I'm putting my knife through there to find that gap. Yeah, tendon.
be out on that joint. Um, the camera stopped recording there for a bit, which is really bloody annoying. But basically, again, found the joint of that. Same old story. Cut all the cartilage and tendons around it. Breaks itself open. That's three really solid portions there. Far easier to store. Lots more you can do with them. Just want to point out here on the lower shoulder, that's some just fantastic steaks that you can get out of that. And that's good tender meat too. Um, and I th honestly, I think the shoulder is utterly underrated like that. It can be very good and tender. Just a lot of people find them strange cuts to work with. That's really good. Don't miss out on it. Well, folks, um, I've got to repeat that process again with the other, other leg, the other shoulder. And I've got a whole lot of packaging up and vacuum sealing to do. But um, yeah, so the camera's getting in the way a little bit, so I'm going to finish my job. I'm proud to display that though, guys. That's um, a huge amount of meat off one animal. And that's the, the beauty of this scenario where I've got to take it home, hang it out in the cold, shot it in the head. Everything's just perfect about it. So, um, yeah, as you can see, it's amateur hour here. You know, I'm not an expert. This is just the way I'm doing it. If you have any other ways that you do it, if you've got any other suggestions for people who are new to this game, just suggestions for me and ways I can get more out of this whole situation, let me know, put it in the comments. We always love uh, the open conversation. Anyway guys, I hope it's been helpful anyway. Anyway, let's keep our good times natural. Respect.